So I am I am now recording. All right. So um, all I really wanted to do tonight was continue the discussion on the conservation of momentum. Uh, last time we talked about momentum, and again, you know, there, I might have problems on my end too. If I lose power, you know, what well, we we did our best, right? So, uh, but anyway, um, let's try to. I really want to do is 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 talk about the better uh, about three major problems and um, and in that way, illustrating momentum. So hopefully you guys, there's enough light, you guys see everything. Um, the first thing I wanna talk about was what, so we have collisions, we talked about collision problems. Uh, there are two types of collisions. Let's see. make sure my pens actually work. All right, let me line this back up. All right. Here we go. So there are two types of collisions. And they are elastic and inelastic. Elastic collisions and inelastic collisions. These are the two types of collisions. Everybody, everybody see the whiteboard okay? I, I have a little bit of a uh, of a glare. Um, yeah, yes. Okay, good. So, any elastic collisions are kind of a special case, and they kind of they actually kind of don't exist. Um, so, in both in all collisions, momentum is conserved. Again, provided system is uh, isolated. Oops. Okay, so isolated system, we talked about that last time as well. Hopefully I'm not falling off the board here. So isolated system is one where the net total, the total net force on the system is zero. The net external force in the system is zero. That would be referred to as an isolated. Uh, referred to as an isolated system. Turns out the isolated systems are very easy to achieve. Um, you know, you know, it's so generally speaking, it's uh, it's uh, very very hard for mechanical systems to actually have conservation of energy. But conservation momentum is uh, is uh, readily available for the most part. Now, an elastic collision um, is one where not only is momentum conserved but so also is energy. Okay, so an elastic collision, one of the things that is conserved is energy, not just momentum. For any elastic collision, only momentum is conserved. All right, so that's the difference. In both collisions, in all collisions, as I mentioned, both energy and momentum are conserved. I'm sorry, in all collisions, momentum is conserved. Only in elastic collisions is energy conserved. Now, a typical example of an, of an elastic collision is a, a, a pool ball or a cue ball hitting a, hitting a pool ball, all right? And so, so generally, you know, people use, usually use that as an example of a good example for energy cons for, a, for an elastic collision. But if I were to play a sound bite, let's just say, hey, I, I'm, I'm gonna play a sound bite and I want you to tell me what the sound is. And I were to play the clack of a, of a cue ball hitting a, hitting a, a, a pool ball, I think almost all of anybody who's been inside of a bar before is going to know that that is the sound of a cue ball hitting a pool ball. The very fact that I can actually identify that sound means a, at least some sound energy is being given off. So some energy is escaping the system. Not very much, but at least some. And if any energy is escaping, that means that your system is really inelastic. An elastic collision is one where energy is truly conserved. And we can approximate some in your in your book, but in general, they really don't exist. 
They exist in theory, in, you know. And so, generally speaking, when you have a collision problem, you can always assume you can you can uh, you can uh, conserve momentum. You have to be told if you can conserve energy. I mean, I'll, I'll write that down. All right. So you have to be told that the system is elastic. All right. So in all collision problems that you get, momentum is conserved. To apply conservation of energy, you must be told that the system is elastic or that the collision is elastic. If you're not told that, then you're not free to do that. All right. So again, you have to be told. There's a little bit of a glare there. But what it says is in all collisions, in all collision problems, momentum is conserved. To apply conservation of energy, you must be told that the collision is elastic. Okay. Generally speaking, if you're not told that, then that is not something that you can do. All right. So what I'm going to do now is I want to work out. Now, generally speaking, uh, what I what I typically do is I is I put the problem on the board. You know, and then I work problems out. I mean, to save some time, I'm not going to do that this time around. So I'm going to tell you what problem it is. And the problems are out of OpenStax. So there is a copy of OpenStax on um, Canvas. And so um, I will read the problem to you. You can play this video back if you're not really sure what the problem says. I'm going to try to write down all the givens and everything else. But so I'm going to work a few problems here. So the, the, this next problem is going to be one that, that employs a la, um, an elastic collision. It'll be OpenStax 8.30. Okay, 8.30 out of OpenStax. The problem says the following. You have a 70-kilogram ice hockey goalie. Okay, I'm going to give the big goalie, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refer to his mass as a big a capital M. We're going to say it's 70 kilograms. I'm going to kind of write it up here, I guess. So mass of the goalie is 70.0 kilograms. All right, let's keep reading. So a 70 kilogram ice hockey goalie originally at rest. Okay, I'm going to use letters describing the goalie with capital letters. So I'm going to say that capital V naught is zero. Ice hockey goalie is initially at rest. Okay, so we have an ice hockey goalie at rest. Okay. Um, he catches a 0 0.150 kilogram hockey puck slapped at him. Okay, the hockey puck is little m. Okay, and that's going to be zero points a small mass, 0 0.150 kilograms. And it's going to be slapped at him at um, 35.0 meters per second. I'm going to assume that the that the the goalie is going to be kind of a, you know, my system, the goalie is going to be here, and the puck is initially begun, is going to be going to the left. So I'm going to assume the puck is going to be heading toward the goalie. And so my before picture, before the collision, you know, basically, basically you have a, you have a, even though the hockey, the goalie may catch the hockey puck or, or he may miss it either way, it's officially a collision. You have two bodies hitting each other. Either they're going to fly apart or they're going to stick together. Irrespectively, it's still a collision. So I'm going to say that in my orientation, that to the right is positive and to the left is negative. So I'm going to assign V naught a negative value because I'm going to say that it is um, that it is um, going to it's, it's going to be initially to the left. Hang on one second, I got a message here. All right. So V naught, little V naught, is negative thirty five meters per second. All right. Now. Let's keep reading the problem. Says the, um, suppose the goalie and the ice puck have an elastic collision. Okay, elastic collision. That means I can conserve energy. Great. So again, that's another piece of information in the problem. It's an elastic collision. 
means energy conservation is possible. So again, it's an elastic collision. So energy conserved. Let's continue. And the puck is reflected back in the direction from which it came. What will be the final velocities um, in this case? All right, so we don't know the final velocity of either, we're being asked the final velocity of both the goalie and the puck. All right, so I'm gonna erase a few things here. So again, note, you know, what we're doing here. I need, I need uh, unlike our, our classroom, I need as much space as possible. But what we're looking for is the final velocity of the goalie, capital V, and I'm also looking for the final velocity of the puck, little v. So again, I use a little not symbol, v not, as initial as an initial velocity. And I use the I use the one without the little zero on the bottom as the final velocity. Again, we've done that in class. All right. Capital letters uh, describe the goalie. Small letters describe the the, um, the hockey puck. All right. Now, I can always apply conservation of momentum. All right, so again, I can always do that. So conservation of momentum, let's do that first. So again, keep keep taking take good notes here. So I'm gonna be doing a lot of erasing because this is this is a problem that I should take up a lot of space on my whiteboard. So this is gonna be a little challenging to do this. I've done it before clearly because I have I have um I have a bunch of YouTube videos, but again, it, it is challenging to do long large problems um with a little tiny whiteboard that I have at home. All right, so let's conserve um uh, momentum first and foremost. So um, again, what are, what are we saying here? Well, the total momentum before is equal to the total momentum after. All right, so before the, the goalie, we'll say is at capital M, capital V naught. That's his momentum. The hockey puck is little m, little v naught. Okay. And that's, now that, that is their, that's the initial velocity. Again, in your system, What's conserved is the total momentum of the total momenta of all of the of the objects, all the bodies in the in the in the system. Afterwards, what do we have? Well, afterwards we have total m total v, or the mass of the, go of the goalie times the, times the velocity of the goalie plus m v. Now, one simplification I can make is I know the goalie is initially at rest, so nicely I can at least say that that's zero. So that first term on the left is zero. So what I'm left with now, and again, you know, this is another line of algebra for you, but I'm going to do the eraser theorem, as a professor of mine used to call it, is that this is another line for you, but not for me, is this is the, your next line of algebra is going to look like this. So the conservation of momentum is going to, is going to look like this for you. So I'm going to write that there's a little glare where I am, so I'm going to try to keep track. Keep on. I said glare of my computer, but I'm gonna I'm gonna put the so we know what the values are. Okay, we're gonna remember what the values of the goalie and the and the puck are. I'm not gonna keep that up there. And what we have here is I'm just gonna kind of keep where we are right now. We have an equation for the conservation of momentum. All right. So let me kind of put that in the, what I call the parking lot. So up here, what do we have so far? Well, we have little m, little b naught is equal to capital M, capital V plus mv. That's what we have right now, conservational momentum. All right, so we have one equation. Well, there is a little bit of a problem. And that is, if I don't know anything else, I'm kind of stuck, right? Because I have one equation and two unknowns. And I, and I do know, even though these are look like variables, I know the m's, I do know little v naught. I do not know capital V and I do not know little v. I do not know the final velocities. So if I, unless I know another piece of information, I'm stuck. But I do know another piece of information, and that is I know that, that I can also apply the conservation of energy. So that, you know, again, the play, doing physics is like, is like playing chess. You know, you want to kind of look at what, what moves you have, you know, what, what you know, kind of look, at, look ahead on your moves. So, so, so what, do I, what do I want to do? Well, the conservation of energy is going to do what? Give me another equation, and then I'll have what? Two equations, two unknowns, and then I can actually solve that. That's where I'm going. So I need to apply conservation of energy. And I can do that for only one reason, because I was told that the collision is elastic. Generally speaking, energy is very swirly. I generally, 
you know, even though it is conserved in the universe, it's not cons usually conserved in your system. All right, that's the problem. You, and for you, what you care about is your system, right? So what would the, what would the conservation of energy? Well, the conservation of energy would say that the total, kinetic, the total kinetic energy initial, and again, remember, it's, we don't have a conservation of kinetic energy, it's conservation of energy. But remember, the, this is a flat problem, which means the potential energies cancel out. The potential energies of all the particles after are, are the same as the potential energy before because they don't change heights. We're assuming everything is nice and flat, all right? So that means that the conservation of energy, well, here, let me, let me uh, back it up with one more statement here. So generally speaking, again, a lot of your book, or at least the previous book used to call it conservation of kinetic energy, which as I said, doesn't exist, right? Conservation of energy is what exists. So Ke sub i plus Pe sub i is Ke sub f plus Pe sub f. Right. Generally speaking, you have kinetic and potential energy before equals kinetic and potential energy after the collision. But PE sub I, when I, I'm just kind of writing down what I just said, is equal to PE sub F because the goalie and puck do not change height or do not change altitude. Potential energy is an energy of configuration. It's an energy of where you are located relative in a force field, the force field of gravity in this case. And so again, um, if, if, if we're talking about everything being flat, like in this problem, again, PE sub I and PE sub F are the same, so they cancel. That means I can cancel them in here and all I'm really involved, all this really, in, oops, I'm sorry, wrong guy. All that's really involved is the potential energy. All right, I'm sorry, the kinetic energy. So potential energies can cancel. And so conservation of energy for a flat collision problem, because of this uh, flatness, where the heights don't change, what, when, what ends up happening is, I really have that the kinetic energy initial is equal to the kinetic energy final. So I'm gonna drive that point home because I've seen some books that talk about the conservation of kinetic energy. And again, there is no such principle as the conservation of kinetic energy. It just ha so happens to be for problems like this, but the principle is the conservation of energy, all right? So case of I, what is that? Well, I have one half capital M capital B naught squared, that's for the goalie initially, plus one half little m little b naught squared for the um, puck. Afterwards, we have one half capital M capital B squared, for the goalie plus one half mv squared for the puck. All right, so that's what we have here in, in, our, in our conservation of energies. Now, again, I, I'm able to simplify things initially by saying I know the goalie is initially at rest. And so I um, can get rid of that term. And by the way, I can also cancel out all these one halves. And the one halves are officially there, but algebraically they can cancel out now. So what that tells me is I have a second equation. I have M little v naught squared is big M big V squared plus little m little v squared. I have that equation now. So great, I, I have two equations, two unknowns. So that means I can solve this problem. The not so great thing is the fact is that these velocities are squared. That means that the algebra is going to be somewhat nasty because I have to square stuff. So again, bear with me here. We're going to go through the algebraic. Uh, we're going to go through the algebra on these. And I, as I mentioned, the uh, the momentum conservation problems are kind of gnarly, and it doesn't help to uh, be on a very small whiteboard. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the momentum equation. I'm going to, so kind of pay close attention to your notes. So I'm going to do a lot of erasure. You know, this is a relatively big problem. And I have this glare, but there's a glare. Can you guys see through the glare, that little glare on my computer on the screen? Is that, is that bothersome? Um, it doesn't bother me, but... Does it bother anybody? It's still visible. Huh? It's still visible. It's still visible okay. for me. I can see through it. it Fantastic. All right. That's good. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I just want to make sure that I'm not like... 
you know, I'm getting the point across. You're not, you're not looking, looking around something or wondering like, well, what does that really say? All right. So what I want to do, here's the, here's the chess, here's a chess game. I have two unknowns, the uh, final velocity of the, of the goalie and final velocity of the puck. And I'm going to have to just do simultaneous solution. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the top equation and solve it for little v. So I'm going to subtract the terminator side and divide by m. All right. So I'm going to do two steps of algebra one. I have to kind of do that. So this equation can be written as the following. Little v is equal to little v naught minus capital M over little m times big V. All right, so all I did is I just, I just did two steps of algebra to rewrite the top equation this way, okay? And what am I gonna do now? What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna take this and plug it in right here into the, into the, into the kinetic energy equation. So I'm gonna eliminate uh, little v in the second equation. What I'll get is one equation that's only going to have one variable that I solve for an SME capital V. All right. And so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to replace my momentum conservation equation because I am, I am uh, challenged on uh, space here. I'm going to replace it with, um, with my new equation. And then we're going to kind of put it in the parking lot. So basically this is nothing but the conservation of energy equation, but kind of written uh, in a way that, you know, is solved uh, for a little v. So I'm going to rewrite it up here, little v naught minus capital M over little m times capital V. And I'm going to put a little star next to it because we're going to go back to that equation. Why? Because I'm going to solve for big V. And then, of course, when I, when I, when I solve for that, I'll have a number. Then I can plug that number back in where? Plug it right back in here and then solve for little v. That's, that's the method of my madness here. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to do the substitution. So again, if anybody isn't ready for me to erase, uh, please, uh, please squawk. Um, all right. So let's do the substitution. So what, what, what is it I'm going to do? Well, I'm going to take this, the second equation, mv naught squared, okay? plus capital M, capital V squared, plus little m. Now, instead of V squared, what am I going to put in here? I'm going to put in the right-hand side of star. So I'm going to stick this in here instead. V naught minus capital M over little m times capital V. And unfortunately, I have to square that. All right, so now I'm, I'm left with one equation. I, I plugged this, the first equation, solved for little v's, I plugged into the second equation. Now what I have is one equation. But of course, we're not done. We have some algebra to do, right? So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, I'm going to uh, just kind of square this out. So again, feel free. We're we're this is a this is a um, a session where you know don't feel free don't feel like it's a monologue. If you have a question, just call it out. You know it's, it's perfectly okay to do so. Just like you would in class. I mean, I can't see your hand raised, of course, and and I don't know. I mean, I haven't been on Zoom for a while, so I'm sure there's a way to raise your hand in Zoom, but we're not going to worry about that. I hope this is the only Zoom session we have. Hopefully, we don't. It's the only kind of storm like this we have. Um, anyway, um, MV not squared plus capital M, capital V squared. I'm going to leave a little m outside. And remember FOIL. FOIL says I square the first term. So it's going to be little v naught squared. And then I multiply the, these other two terms together and I multiply by two. So, my, my, so minus two, capital M over little m, little v naught v. And then I square the second term. Of course, squaring it makes it positive. Hopefully I can fit it on the video here. So we have capital M squared over M squared. Let's see, am I still on? Yep. Times V squared. Now I'm still in parentheses. All right. So I squared out, and this is a little v. Little v naught squared, multiply them out. So I have minus two, capital M over little m, v naught, big V plus capital M squared little over little m squared plus big V squared. Now I have one more thing to do. And that is to multiply through little m. So next line of algebra, we have m v naught squared plus capital M capital V squared plus, we multiply this, then this, this guy becomes, um, uh, hang on one second. I, oh, you know what? I messed up. 
there's an equal sign right here. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, so correct your nose. There's an equal sign right there. He went on vacation, but he's back. All right, so yeah, so that, you know, remember I'm rewriting this equation. So I M B naught squared equals kappa M cap B squared and then plus this stuff, right? So again, I apologize for that. It's kind of looking at that and going, what happened? Yes, it's my brain on the thunderstorm here. All right, so M B naught squared plus kappa M cap B squared. Okay, so this, this multiplies through and it gives me, again, this is a equals. This gives me M V naught squared, okay? When I multiply the M through here, it, it cancels out the M of the denominator in the second term. So I'll have minus two, capital M, V naught, big V. And then multiplying the little M to the third term cancels out one factor of M. So what, what I'm left with is a, as a denominator, which is one M instead of, instead of a square. So I have big M squared over little M times big B squared. And of course the parentheses have gone away. All right, so I'll rewrite this equation up on top. So I don't want to raise star because I'm going to need star in a minute. So I'm going to transfer this equation higher. And that's what I have to do when I'm doing this. So I'm going to, so we already used the conservation of energy equation. We're not going to use it again. Um, we will only go, we will only revert back to the conservation of momentum equation that I've solved for little b and I put a little star next to it. So again, we're, we're, we're getting there, not much more. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna just basically translate this equation up. So what I have now is m v naught squared equals capital M capital V squared plus m v naught squared minus two big M v naught capital V plus m squared over m v squared. I'm stretching a little bit, so sorry for my handwriting. Hope you guys are okay with that. All right, there you go. Now at this point, you hope something cancels out. And yes, on the, on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, we have one cancellation. These two terms cancel out. So that's great. And so what we can do is we can, we can cancel that out and then write what we have left. So I'm gonna kind of flip about the equal sign here. So I have capital M, capital V squared, uh, minus two, capital M, V naught, capital V, plus big M squared over M times capital V equals zero. All right, let me pause for a moment. Does anybody have a question about how I got that far? Okay, so again, I hope my capital M's, my little M's are distinctive of each other. All right, so what we can do is um, we can factor out at least uh, something, something common. Everything, every term in common has at least one capital M in it. And every term also has a capital V. So I can pull those out. So I can pull out capital M, capital V. And what am I, le what am I left with? If I pull that out and this term, all that remains is just one capital V. This M is gone, this V is gone. I have a minus two uh, V naught. That's all that's left there. And this one of these M's and this B is gone. So I'm left with a capital M over a little M. And that's what I have. And that's equal to zero. So let's see here, did I do that right? Um, yes. All right, so now um, I can cancel out the capital M here. Now this capital V, kind of remind, remember from algebra, um, you have two factors multiply together to give you a zero. If I have A times B equals zero, that means that A can be zero, B can be zero, or both are zero, right? So what that basically means is that well, I have two solutions to this equation. One of the solutions is capital V equals zero. That's what we call the trivial solution. It's not, it's not really physical. We can throw that one away. The other solution is what's in the parentheses, the contents of the parentheses is zero. That's the one we're interested in. So when I cancel out capital V like that, I'm basically saying that's a trivial solution that I don't care about. Okay. Uh, yes, Edmundo. Uh, yeah, on that uh, big V at the uh, at the end of your uh, left hand equation. Um, yeah. How did you go from V big V squared to little uh, V squared? 
Uh, and that's before you took out the uh, the big MV. On the second uh, on the second uh, equation, you see a uh, MV squared minus two yeah. MV little V squared. V, yeah, you went uh, the big v, v at the end. Capital V. Yep. So I have I have capital uh, M capital V squared minus two capital M V naught capital V. That's a small V naught plus two capital M squared over M times big V. I think that's yeah. right. Um, now I pull out one capital M capital V. So this capital M's gone. One of the capital V's is gone. So I'm left with just big V. So one of the V's is one of the V's is gone, and one of the M's is gone. So I extracted it. This term. Okay. Yep. The. You see it. Yeah, but at the end, uh, that big V is it's squared on the uh, the one above the one equation above. So, uh, is it? Oh, yeah. You know, you are right. Thank you. Yep, I made a mistake. Yes, it didn't look right. There you go. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thanks. Does that look good now? All right. So there you go. So thank you for yes. catching that. All right, so yes, I would have. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so I have essentially two terms that are proportional to capital V, and I have this term that doesn't have any capital V in it. Also, let's let's kind of write another uh, line where we don't have um, we don't have um, the parentheses anymore. So I'm going to transfer this up. So hopefully, every, every I can erase this stuff. And sorry for the weird lecture tonight, but I think I'd rather keep you guys safe. And you have to if you have to run into your bathroom to. <laughs> Shelter from a tornado, I'd rather have you be at home. All right, um, so we're left with your capital V minus two V naught plus capital M over little m times capital V equals zero. So that's what we are left with. And um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna collect together at this point, anything that has capital V in it. And I'm gonna throw the term, it doesn't have the velocity on side. I'm gonna take this term here and throw it on the side. So I'm gonna, and I'm gonna factor at the same time. So I'm gonna have capital V factored out. I'll have one minus, or one plus, sorry, capital M over little m. And that's gonna equal two V naught. All right, so I'm down to pretty much that. Now, I want to put capital V by itself. And so for me to do so, um, what I wanna do now is I wanna get a common denominator. There's an extra step of algebra for you, but over here, I have the number one, but I can actually write that in a more uh, suggestive way. And I'm in a common denominator, so I can actually write that as little m over little m. I'm just doing arithmetic here. So getting a common denominator. So, so what I really want to do is I'm going to divide what's in that parentheses. And for me to divide something, I need to be able to do a multiplicative inverse, which means I need a common denominator. All right, so now what I can do, is that, is that clear to everybody? So now that I have a common denominator, I can just add these two. So the next line is capital V is little m plus big M over little m, and that's equal to 2V naught. And now I can multiply by the, by the inverse, multiplicative inverse of each side, and I've then solved the equation. So that'll be the next line of algebra that I do. And so all I'm going to do is I'm going to basically multiply both sides by the multiplicative inverse. On the left side, that's going to cancel things out. I have capital B uh, by itself. On the right side, I'm going to have two little m v naught divided by little m plus big M. Okay, that is everything on the right hand side of this last equation. I I know, and the, and I can calculate that with the numbers that are given to calculate the things that I don't know. All right, so. The problem is mostly done because what's left after this is I'm, and I'm just going to, I'm just going to actually just plug in. Normally I would just wait until the very end to plug in numbers, but let's just kind of, you know, for what, you know, for the real estate problem I have right now, let's just kind of uh, put it, put in numbers now. So capital V is a mass of the final velocity of the goalie. And what I can, I can basically say is I know it's two. Now go back in your notes. The mass of the hockey puck, I told you, was 0 0.150 kilograms. The initial velocity of, now we, we, we have to be careful here. The initial velocity, we're talking velocity, not speed. The initial velocity of the goalie was negative 35 meters per second. Remember the, I'm oh, sorry, not the goalie, the, the puck. The puck was heading to the left. So it's going to have a negative 
35.0 meters per second. Okay, that's 2m v naught on top. On the bottom, it's going to be nothing more than just the total mass of the system, which is going to be the puck plus the goalie. So the puck is 0 0.150 kilograms, and the goalie is, he's much bigger, 70.0 kilograms. And I find out that the goalie, you know, the big goalie, you don't expect him to move very fast after the collision. And it turns out, and you would expect, you know, you would expect with physical intuition, he'd probably get pushed backwards a little bit from recoil. And, and, and that indeed is the truth. So you have negative 0 0.15 meters per second. So the goalie is not going to get pushed back by much. The goalie is going to initially be at rest. And, then he, and again, we're talking no friction on the ice. And the final velocity of the goalie is going to be negative 0 0.15 meters per second. Okay, so let me stop for a second. Does anybody have any question about how I got to that, to that value? Okay, I take that as a no then. So in my parking lot, I'm just going to write that up here. So this is actually one of my answers. One of my answers is capital V is, uh, second. hang on a second. My, one of my answers is capital V is negative 0. Point, ah. Do this, get done with this class for another storm hits us. In 0 0.15 meters per second, right? So I know that answer now. Now what I can do is I can go back to the equation that I labeled as star. And, um, and I can just I can then plug in capital V directly and solve finally for the puck final velocity. So so little v is little v naught. Well, little v naught is um, was a negative uh, thirty five point zero meters per second. Uh, actually, yes. Uh, actually, you know what? I'm not done yet. <laughs> uh, well, actually, I. I lied to you a little bit. All right, here. I'm sorry about that. All right. So we do have to do this, but I did I did tell a little fib here. All right. Let's I apologize. So let's go back um, to the final velocity one more time. Um, yes. Um, sorry about that. yeah. Um, um yeah, final velocity. For the goalie, let's go back to the actual equation. The final velocity of the goalie was um, was two. Sorry, I apologize. This is this is the right answer, but again, I, I was premature on it. So again, it's it's this um, doing a video here. So two m v naught over little m plus capital M. All right. So that's what we did get get to. Uh, what I actually want to do is when I plug in to star, I want to plug in officially this formula. So sorry about that. So when I do that, I have V naught, uh, sorry, V, little V, final velocity V is V naught minus capital M over little m. Instead of capital V, I want to plug in the final answer that I got for the, uh, the, the final answer I got, the final formula that I, was, that I uh, attained for the, no, for, the, for the final velocity of the, of the goalie. So I'm going to throw that in here. And that's going to be 2m v naught over little m plus big M. Okay, sorry about that. I can cancel out these little m's. And what I get is v equals v naught minus 2 capital M v naught over little m plus big M. All right. And what I can do now is I can actually get a common denominator. Again, this is an uh, this is another step of algebra. Well, I'll just put it up there. So I get it. I want to. I want to. I have v naught that's common to both of these terms. I want to add them together. So I want to get a common denominator. A common denominator would be little m plus big M. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply little m plus big M, top and bottom, numerator and denominator, um, on v naught. Essentially, I'm, I'm essentially multiplying by one, but in a very suggestive way. So let me do that. So I'm just basically doing arithmetic now. So I have little, little v equals, right, common denominator, little m plus big M over little m plus big M and multiply by one times v naught. And then what I had on the second term, 
minus two capital M B naught over little m plus big M. So now it's a matter of combining like terms or, or basically combining the two equations. I have the same, I have the same um, uh, denominator. So I can factor out little v. So I have little v. And what I have here now is little m plus big M minus two big M's. And on the bottom denominator, I have little m plus big M. And I have big M minus two big M's, that's negative big M, right? And so what I, what I actually have now is a final formula for the puck. All right, so again, we wanna to try to get theoretical formulas. Um, I, try, I got ahead of myself there, so I'm sorry I, I did that. Uh, but what we have now is we have B naught. What's on top is what's left on top on the numerator is M minus big M, right? Big M minus two big M is just negative big, big M. So I have M minus big M divided by M plus big M. That's actually my final formula for the puck velocity, final velocity for the puck. Anybody have any questions about how I got that? Now I got ahead of myself. And so the next thing I would do if we were in class together is I'd say, all right, let's plug in variables, guys. Well, I did that already. So I plugged in the variables for the final puck uh, velocity. And that is what we see here. Final puck velocity is negative 0 0.15 meters per second. What I need to do now is plug in the numbers for the uh, final velocity of the, um, of the puck. All right, this is the final velocity of the goalie. So for the puck, V equals, right? So again, let's be careful with our, with our, our signs. Uh, v naught, remember, is negative. So negative 35 meters per second. And then I have little m was 0 0.150 kilograms minus 70 kilograms. That is the goalie divided by 0 0.150 kilograms plus 70 kilograms. Now you notice that the numerator is going to be negative. And this uh, velocity is negative, so two negatives are going to cancel out and make a positive. And so what you're going to get, again, I'll, I'm seeing a glare right here, so let me try to avoid the glare and rewrite what I just said. I want to make sure I, I drive this home. Again, I'm plugging in numbers into the final equation for the puck. I apologize for a little glare. What I wrote down was this, negative 35 meters per second. And I had a difference of the masses, little m, 0 0.150 kilograms, minus 70 kilograms. And on the bottom, on the denominator, more precisely, 0 0.150 kilograms plus 70 kilograms. All right, and so when you do that math, again, you, see, you, can, you can perceive that the uh, numerators, the numbers are gonna be positive no matter what, the numerator is gonna be negative, and this factor here is negative. So your final velocity to puck is gonna be 34.85 meters per second. And let's, let me even be more explicit, positive 34.85 meters per second. Why am I doing that? Because I wanna point out that, okay, the puck is initially going very fast, but it has a small velocity. I'm oh, sorry, it has a small mass. So the puck is, has a high velocity, but a small mass, is hitting a big mass that's going, that's, um, that is stationary. After the collision, I expect the big mass to not be pushed back uh, very fast, and it isn't, but it should be pushed back. It should be going in a negative direction. I expect the puck to bounce off the goalie and deflect over in a positive direction. And that's exactly what that's telling you. So my physical intuition is correct that I, you know, a small mass is gonna have a large speed or a large velocity, a big mass is gonna have a small, small velocity. And that's what you would see in reality, all right? This is like a, 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 a fly hitting a Mack truck or something. I mean, you're, you're you know, essentially, the, you know, the, the goalie is gonna dominate, but, but there's gonna, but the, but the little, the little, um, object is going to is going to be winging off at a much at a much higher velocity okay and that's that problem any any questions about that again momentum problems are not are not um generally pretty they're mathematically uh, involved as i told you and it's even more complicated when you 
have to deal with this uh, scenario here with a with the little whiteboard. But okay, that's that's it for OBIS eight point thirty. Yes. Okay, I was wondering. Okay, because you used a lot of algebra formulas. It's been a long time since I took algebra. Um, mm -hmm. should we like just look it up online about different ones and just rememorize them all, or do you have like a sheet somewhere we can look at? With the formulas, we should know. Well, there's nothing to memorize. Uh, every problem is unique. Okay, so and all, we just and all we're really so, so let me kind of I know and I know normally what I would do at this point is I would go back through the algebra and I'd go I'd have I'd right. have three whiteboards completely covered up right <laughs> and with stuff. But what did we do? Okay, we I was actually mostly okay, wondering. Okay, so most of them are just like simple like mathematical concepts. Okay, I can just solve it that way. The one that is hard is the one you used to separate the two squares, like the square of something plus the square of something equals the square of something. I think you used a formula there that I can't remember or something like that. I didn't do that. That you're I think you're thinking At of the beginning? No. When um, I, oh, I, I, oh, well, I may have squared. I think what what you might be talking about is I is I said something like a plus b is a squared plus two a b. Yeah, that one or something right. like that. Similar. But that. I mean, I remembered that. But if, if you don't remember that, oops. If you don't remember that, you could do yeah, the right. following. You could, you could just go through foil yourself and say, "Well, I don't." Okay. Let's say, let's say I don't remember that, but I do know that that would be this, and then I say, "Okay, well, everybody gets a turn. It's a's turn. A times a." is a square okay a has done has gone to a it's going to go to b that's going to be an a b okay so a is okay. done now it's b's turn b times a a b and b times b is b squared right so okay. effectively you'd have the same thing a squared plus two a b plus b squared again this is right. this is the algebra that you, that you come to the class with i mean i okay. say for if you don't one of the things in this class is if you don't know something right off the bat um, sometimes that tells you that, okay, Mel, well, maybe I need to go look that up. You know, I, I don't, I don't remember this, um, foil for instance. So, so again, cause, cause what we assume coming in here is like, you have algebra, you have trigonometry and you, we have to kind of go from there, but you know, it's a good point. But again, when you see something that you don't quite recognize, or maybe it's not familiar to you say, kind of note that I better look that up and, and, um, you know, how did he get that, you know, a squared plus two, a b plus b squared. Oh, okay. That's foil. Maybe do a couple practice problems. You'll be right on, you'll be right on it. That's all I, that's all I did there. But to cap off, to recap the problem, what we just did is all I did is I applied the conservation momentum and I applied the conservation of energy because I was told that the collision is elastic. And then I had two equations, two unknowns. Unfortunately, the variables in the second equation were squared, um, you know, but it is what it is. Hey, at least I have two equations, two unknowns. They may not be pretty equations, but at least I can solve them. And then from there, I just got to go through and do just chug through a bunch of algebra. So in physics problems, you essentially will define the physics. You go away for a bit into, into math land. Then you come back out and you go back to physics. So again, that's Generally, what you end up having to go do is, you know, you a lot of things. I mean, people get the Nobel Prize. They what did what did they get it for? It wasn't the math. They got it for setting up the problem. I know what problem to set up, and from there, I can I can go. I can I once I know what problem to set up, then I can just plug through the through the math. Answer your question. I think she may have dropped off. Okay. Anybody have any other questions? Okay. Um, all right. So the next uh, problem I want to do is a is a basic inelastic collision problem, one dimension. And again, when I say inelastic, that means that I do not get conservation of energy at my fingertips. And you know, in some ways, you might say, "Well, that's probably good because I don't want to do all that squaring stuff." So inelastic collision problems, and we kind of we saw the very first problem I gave with the train cars. That's an example of one. As you saw. That problem was very much um, in violation of the conservation of energy. There, there was no conservation of energy. You, you lost, you, if I recall, you lost 74% of all your energy in that one. <clears throat> so the next thing I want to do, so I want to do another problem. We're only going to do three problems tonight, believe it or not, but you know that was one of them. Uh, I'm going to do, this is, this is a problem on inelastic collision, which means that I do not in any way have energy conservation at my fingertips. I hope I have enough information to just use conservation momentum. 
All right, so this is going to be open stacks 8.32. Okay, we just did 8.30. So I'm going to, so again, you know, look it up on, you know, um, I do have open stacks. Hopefully you, you've down, you, you pulled a copy down off of the, um, off of the uh, um, canvas by now. Um, so here we go. So during an ice show, a 60 kilogram skater leaps into the air and is caught by an initially stationary 75 kilogram skater. A, what are the final velocities assuming negligible friction and that the 60 kilogram skater's original horizontal velocity was four meters per second? Okay, so that's important. So let's kind of write down what we just, what I just read. All right, so I'm going to, I need all the space I can get. So I'm going to rewrite this problem number. So 8.32. So. Okay, so what we're being told here is that we have two skaters. One has a mass of 80, of 60 kilograms and a velocity, really V1 is 4.00 meters per second. It's entirely in the X direction. And that's important here because I'm going to apply conservation momentum. So I need to know that it's, you know, that I, I really have a one dimensional problem. I mean, our problem is one dimensional plus X and negative X, All right. So I have one dimensional problem. That's, that's why it's stated that way. It's not just like, well, it's, it's, it's a two dimensional and there's so, so much of it's in the X, so much of it's in the Y. No, we're explicitly told that the entire initial moment of velocity of this, of, of, of M1, skater M1, skater one is entirely horizontal. Skater two, is initially at rest. Skater two is gonna catch skater one. So skater two has a mass, and skater two is bigger, uh, a mass of 75 kilograms, okay? And the two are gonna stick together and skate off together at the end, all right? So the before picture, and I can only apply conservation of, of um, of momentum. I cannot apply conservation of energy because I was not told that I could. And I can tell you this much. If you have two bodies that are going to collide and they stick together, that's about the most inelastic collision that you can have. No way will you have energy conservation. You saw that with the train car problem. You saw that we lost about 74% of the energy. All right. So if you see two bodies stuck together and they, and they, and they move off together, um, you know there's no way that energy is conserved, all right? So before, so you no, know, my momentum before must equal momentum uh, after, right? So this is conservation of momentum. Again, conservation of momentum of the entire system, not of any individual. The momentum of any individual um, object will certainly change. It's the total system momentum that is conserved. Okay, before and after. Before picture, what do we have? Total momentum. Well, we have momentum of mass one. So it's going to be M1 V1 plus the momentum of mass two, M2 V2. Afterwards, the two are stuck together, MV. And M is what? M is going to equal the total mass, M1 plus M2. The two masses are stuck together. They're moving off in uh, together. Now, what's nice here is I can simplify the problem a little bit, and that is that V2 is initially zero. I mean, V2 is zero. So the initial velocity, so the mass uh, skater two is actually at rest. And we also have there's we also know that there's no friction. I don't have to worry about any complications at all. And we're going to assume that the ice is perfect, has no no frictional coefficient. All right. So and I don't have conservation of energy at my fingertips. So all I have is this equation. And so what I'm going to do is I mean again remember these these values. And I'm going to have to erase. And I'm going to write. I'm going to re write the. Um, 
the simplified equation with the where I zeroed out zeroed out the uh, second term on the left and then write the simplified equation up. So again, this is nowhere near as, as difficult as a uh, as the previous problem. So what I'm left with is what after after this uh, zeroing out of the of the velocity, I'm left with m one v one is big M big V. That's what I'm left with. Not too bad. All right. And remember, big M is the is the total mass. All right, so now what, what, do I, what, do I, what is it I'm trying to do? I'm trying to solve for the final velocity, capital V. So all I have to do is divide by big M. So big V is little m1 over big M times V1. That's all that's, that's all that's left, and it's not too bad. So throw in the numbers now. Again, I'm solving part uh, A. So big, big V is going to be the initial of, of the um, mass of, the, of skater one is 60.0 kilograms. The total mass, 60.0 kilograms plus 75 kilograms. And the initial velocity, remember, was four meters per second off to the right. When I do that, I find out that the final velocity I'll just write it up. No, no, I can put it in here. Final velocity of the two moving together is 1.78 meters per second. Any questions about that? Again, that's much simpler than the previous one. Now, part B says how much energy, how much kinetic energy is lost? Okay, so we at least know the final velocity. So at this point, uh, let's kind of put down what we know. So that's our that's our answer to part A. There's two parts to this. That's part A. I want to I want to find out using momentum conservation what the final velocity of the two put um, moving together is. So that's A. Now I want to try to find out. And I kind of showed you this with the uh, with the train car problem on Tuesday. I want to find out how much energy is actually lost. How much kinetic energy is lost? All right. So let's kind of put this up in the parking lot here. I'm not, I'm not, we've already done this. So what we're going to gather from part A that we're going to want to use later is this information that we got from, from part A. So 1.78 meters per second. All right, we want to know kinetic energy loss. So there's different ways to do problems. I'm going to kind of show you a little trick, kind of a slick way to, to, to do this. So um, the kinetic energy initial, Okay, kinetic energy initial is going to be what? Well, it's one half m one v one squared. Again, I'm doing part b plus one half m two v two squared. And again, as I told you, the um, skater two was initially at rest, so that that second term is is just zero. Kinetic energy final is one half the two masses together m1 plus m2 and then that big b squared all right now they're moving together as uh, in, um, as a couple so the question is how much uh, how much kinetic energy was uh was lost actually i'm thinking of a different problem so i'm, I'm just gonna all right so kinetic energy loss is gonna be so let's let's look at kinetic energy initial kinetic energy initial is going to be one half m one v one squared, or one half sixty kilograms times uh, four point zero meters per second squared. If you work that out, you find out that the initial kinetic energy multiply that all out, you find out it was a four hundred eighty joules. Altogether, there are 480 joules of energy in that system before the uh, the skater did a leap and was caught by the by by skater two. All right. So initially, we had 480 joules. All right. Now, final velocity. or final kinetic energy, I apologize. 
So that's going to be kinetic energy final is one half the total mass, 60 kilograms plus 75 kilograms, and then 1.78 meters per second squared. And what I get now is the final kinetic energy. Again, as you, as you can imagine, it's 214 joules. So it's, it's gone down. A lot of kinetic, a lot of energy escaped the system. All right, so we start off with 480. We end up with just 214. So how much is lost? Well, that's a simple calculation. So I'm going to save off what we did here. And just a little, little bit of arithmetic left. And then we have, let's see, we're looking at about... 7.30 right now, so I just want to do one more problem and we'll call it a done deal for the night and hopefully every, everybody's going to be okay. So kinetic energy final is 214 joules. All right, how much did you lose? Well, kinetic energy loss, simply going to be a final minus initial, right? So kinetic energy, delta kinetic energy is going to be how much did you lose? It's going to be kinetic energy final minus kinetic energy initial. So delta kinetic energy. And energies are scalars. They just add. They're nice scalar numbers. That's the nice thing about energies is they're, they're not vectors. They're just numbers like you've grown up with all your life. So kinetic energy final is going to be uh, 214 joules minus 480 joules. So the amount of energy that you lost in this problem, one kinetic energy lost is going to equal uh, 266 joules. Kinetic energy lost. And I just made a positive. Negative basically means I lost energy, right? So okay, any questions about that? All right, I just want to do one more problem to call it call it a done deal. And then and then that problem is going to require me basically um, utilizing uh, two-dimensional collisions. All right, so this is the most complicated of all, because we're not going to go to two dimensions. If you thought one dimension is complicated enough, now we're gonna to go to we're gonna to go to two dimensions. Okay, any questions at this point? Okay. All right, so in two-dimensional collisions, so again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of uh, make it a, um, so this is really, I'm gonna be really very specific here. So this is collisions of point particles in two dimensions. And say, why, why do I say this? Well, we've been studying all along what's called translational motion. Next week, we're going to talk about rotational motion, bodies that rotate. Uh, but right now, we're just thinking about bodies that move as if all of the mass is located at what's called the center of mass. Now, if you look at a really bad car accident in a freeway, for instance, you know, you'll notice sometimes a really bad high-speed car accident, you'll notice that sometimes the car is facing the wrong direction in the freeway. And you say, well, how did that happen? Well, what happened was you didn't just get energy of translation, like we'd be talking about here. You also got energy of rotation. And so there was a rotation that, that happened. So the car got, you know, spun around, for instance, got rotated. All right. And so, again, we're not, we're not concern, concerning ourselves with that kind of energy right now. We will next week. Not right now. What we're going to do, we're, we're, we don't want to talk about collisions that are going to cause rotation. We just want to talk about collisions right now that are going to be of point particles, where all I care about is translation right now, all right? So with that said, I'm gonna, again, I need uh, real estate, so I'm gonna erase this. Let's kind of draw a little picture here of what we're actually doing. I'll take very careful note of this picture because I'm gonna end up erasing it, unfortunately, and and uh, everything everything I'm gonna write about is gonna be a, with respect to this picture, picture, unfortunately. So I have two particles. So I'm drawing a dash line on my horizontal. I have a particle that has an initial momentum. 
that's going to collide. It's going to be at a, what's called a theta 2i. I'm going to call this particle 2. So it's going to be particle 2. The i stands for initial. And down here, I'm going to have the two are going to collide. We're going to try to make it as general as possible. This particle is going to be going at theta 1i. And this is particle one initial. I stands for initial. So I, I means initial. The two are going to collide, right? Um, this one has a momentum P2I. So it's actually a momentum. It has, it has, a, it has a vector hat. All right, P2I. This one has the momentum P1I. And we're gonna say that, you know, one particle has a mass M1 and the other one has a mass M2. So, you know, this is basically a particle mass M1. This particle has a mass M2, okay? So again, so we have Particle mass one, that's gonna have an initial momentum P2I, piece of two I, put a hat on there because it's momentum. The particle, the two stands for particle two, the I stands for initial, right? And then this one over here, again, everything, all the angles are respect to the horizontal. This one's at an angle, it's, it has a mass M2, it has a momentum P1, oops. Okay, hang on, I wrote this backwards. This is P1I. This is P2I, sorry. This is particle two, <laughs> all right, do this again. So again, I have mass two, it's at an angle through horizontal of theta two I, means particle two, uh, initial, and this is P2I, it's momentum of particle two, the initial momentum of particle two. There's an X component and a Y component to that. Over here, I have particle one. It makes an angle of theta one I with the, with the horizontal, it has a mass M1, and it has a momentum P1I, momentum of particle one, initial. Now, they collide, bang. Right, afterwards, what happens? Well, we have a, a particle coming out like this. Again, we're gonna assume the particles are totally indestructible. And this particle is going to have, with the horizontal, a theta to F, F stands for final. Again, same mass. And it's going to have a P to F. Down here, we're going to have another you know, particle going off the other direction. With the horizontal, it's going to be going at, oh, sorry, I'm, yes, sir. Sorry. It's going to be going at theta 1F that I messed my labels up again, and P2F. Here we go. Okay, so again, the particles are gonna maintain their masses. Some collisions, the particles break up, like some bullets will break into parts and stuff when you, when you fire them and they hit something, where we're gonna assume that these bodies are indestructible, so that M1 is gonna remain M1 after the collision, and mass M2 is gonna remain M2 after the collision. All right, so again, uh, mass, uh, so before the collision, before, this is your before picture. And this is your after. Before, you have a particle, again, I mean as general as possible. You have a particle, a, a, a particle two on top, particle one on the bottom. Particle two has a momentum P2I. It's at an angle theta two I with the horizontal. Particle one has a momentum P1I and it's at an angle theta one I from the horizontal. Bang, they collide. Afterwards, particle two is going off um, at theta two F from the horizontal at P2 F. And particle one, I'm sorry, particle one. <laughs> sorry about that. Particle one is going off at, a, um, theta, at an angle theta one F from the horizontal and it has momentum P1 F. Okay, you guys see the picture? Keep that picture in mind, because unfortunately I have to erase it. All right, can I erase the pictures? Anybody object? 
So keep in mind what the picture is. I'm sorry about that. But again, you, you have it in your notes now. Okay, I'm going to erase it now. We're going to, everything I'm going to talk about, unfortunately, is with respect to this picture. And I would have it on the board, but not tonight. So it's in your notes. So, and if you want to play back the video later, I'm going to make a video, put it on YouTube. You can play back the video later. I'll, I'll give you a link to it as well. So again, um, you know, do stick with me if you, if you, if you like, I mean, we're, we're, we're going to walk through this and, you know, you have direct access to me right now. So, okay. So we're going to have conservation of momentum. What's, what's conservation momentum basically mean? Well, it means total momentum before it goes total momentum after. I have two particles, P1I vector plus P2I equals P1F plus P2F. Doesn't sound too bad. Again, but this is a vector equation. It's agnostic to any coordinate system. What you know with vector equations is that I can re I can re uh, represent them in each coordinate. That's important. E each each relevant coordinate, I can write the conservation. I can write the equation in each coordinate. So um, I can write a, a conservation momentum equation in the x direction. I can write a conservation of momentum equation in the y direction. And if applicable, if I'm in three dimensions, I can write a conservation momentum equation in the z direction too. All right. So. What I can do here is I'm going to go step by step. So I can write this in the X direction. Again, the nomenclature is going to be kind of ugly. I'm going to take the hat off now because I'm going to be talking about scalar equations, each in one in dimension. I'll have an, an X equation. I'll say P1 I X. Okay, I know it's ugly. P1 I, that means momentum of particle one, the initial momentum of particle one in the X direction. And I mean, it's ugly nomenclature. It's a very dressed up uh, subscript. Plus P2IX, again, uh, the X component of the initial momentum of particle two. Okay, equals P1FX plus P2FX. Basically, this is saying that I have it's the initial and final moment initial momentum of particles one and two in the x direction equals the initial and final I'm sorry the, the 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 final momentum of particle one and two in, in the x direction. All right. So again, I'm basically just applying the conservation of momentum in the x direction. This x just signifies that I'm talking about the x direction. And there's two dimensions in this problem, so I can write the same kind of thing in the y direction. So p one i Y plus P two I Y equals P one F Y plus P two F Y. Again, again, I'm just basically saying that the momentum is conserved in the Y direction as well. Any questions about that so far? Um, does it have to be in the same, um, all has to be in the same equation? What do you mean? Like the X direction and the Y direction has to be all in one long direct direction. Well, direction? again, you're conserving momentum in the X direction and independently conserving momentum in the Y direction. All, so I it mean, has to be only conserved in one direction. Um, well, it's conserved in each dimension of importance. So if your problem is a one dimensional problem, then you only have one equation up there. Our problem right now is a two-dimensional problem. Oh, so I right. must have two equations. I must have I must have a conservation momentum in X and I must have a conservation momentum in Y. Yeah, I thought more yeah, all, all of them are gonna be combined in one big big equation. But no, um, no, it's not gonna happen. Yes. And, and if I had a there, there has to be a, the conservation momentum, remember this is we saw this in Newton's second law as well. Newton's second law was a vector equation. We, we did like inclined plane problems and things like that. We saw that there was Newton's second law in the X direction and Newton's second law in the Y direction. Yes. So we have conservation momentum in the X direction, conservation momentum in the Y direction. Yeah, I get it. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Okay. And we had a third dimension, Z. We, we have Z as well. So let me, um, so again, I'm conserving uh, space here. So I'm going to 
look at um, I'm going to look at the controversial momentum in the x direction. I'm going to I'm going to rewrite these equations up here, unfortunately. So I'm going to rewrite them. So p one i x plus p one or p two i x equals p one f x plus p two f x and p one i y plus p two i y equals p uh, yeah uh yeah p one f y plus p two f y i think i got that right yes now this is very this is very theoretical very general we want to apply these equations to our specific problem. And, and again, I, 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 dis, I described our problem in terms of momenta, and I also described it in terms of masses, and I also described it in terms of angles. So, the, so all of these are horizontal, and, I, and all the angles that you saw were angles with respect to the horizontal. Again, look at the picture while I'm talking. I'm sorry I don't have I don't have uh, three panes of uh, whiteboards to show you, but uh, remember that you know horizontal the way because I wrote the the uh, vector in terms of the horizontal, we would expect a cosine of the angle to um, you know to be to to uh, be appearing for horizontal terms. So p one p one i x would be what it would be. Um, it would essentially be P1i, or actually, let's be real here. Uh, what is what's momentum? Mass times velocity, right? So P1i x would be m. Let me write a little bit even further to the left here. P1i x, I'd have P1i, that would be m1v1i. Remember, momentum in general is mass times velocity, right? So I would have. I'd be talking about mass one, and I'd be talking about its initial velocity, and it would be the cosine of theta one i. All right, so it, it would be the horizontal component. So what would be the initial momentum? Well, it would be m one times v one i. But we're talking about the x direction, so there'd be a cosine of theta one i. So if you look at this, I'm just kind of just draw this out for a moment. You know, this was the horizontal, and I said this was theta one i, and this was p one i. So p one i x is gonna be the x component. Or how would I get that? The cosine of theta one i is the adjacent of hypotenuse. All right, so again, I would, if I want p one i x, I would basically take and again, we've been through this before. It would be m1 v1i times cosine theta 1i. That is p1i x in terms of our picture. Is that clear to everybody? If, if, if it's not clear to somebody, please speak up. Okay. p2i x, same kind of deal. It's going to be the m2 v2i times cosine theta 2i equals, again, I told you it's going to be long, long stuff, uh, equals, again, this is one, one big equation. Again, okay, on, on the left-hand side, I'm going to have m1 v1f cosine theta 1f plus m2 v2f cosine theta 2f. This is a this is a way of knowing that I have masses m1 and m2, knowing that they're going to be going at some velocity v1i, v2i, v1f, v2f, because that's essentially what p p1i is m1 times v1i. Right? I mean, if I look at right, I'm sorry, if I look at p1i, I know it's mass times velocity, m1 times v1i. It's going to be an initial velocity applied to particle one. So all I'm really doing is instead of p1i, I'm just breaking it up into its corresponding mass times velocity. But I'm doing so in horizontal components. So I have to put these cosines here. 
Is everybody okay with that equation? But I have a second equation, and that is this one here. Now we're gonna look at this equation, the second one. And, and again, if I look at, if I just take a take uh, the initial velocity of the of uh, particle one, for instance, I'm looking at the y component and I say this is theta one i. Well, now, I mean, for the x component, I did cosine. For the y component, that's the opposite. It's gonna be sine. Effectively, I'm gonna end up writing this whole equation again, but instead of everywhere you see cosine, you're gonna write sine. Because why? Because you're, you are adding up all the y components. I know it's an ugly equation, but again, you have two equations that, so the, the second equation is essentially going to be, so, so let, me, let, me, let me kind of write everything together here. So before I write that, I'm going to, I'm going to probably, I'm going to write them all. So I'm going to erase everything here and I'm going to rewrite this equation and write the other equation. So I'm basically writing those component equations. I'm going to write everything together, you know, so I don't have to worry about the, the glare. Let's kind of write everything together in component form. All right, so the X component equation is going to be, M1, V1, I, cosine of theta, one, I, plus M2, V2, I, cosine of theta, two, I, equals, second line, M1, V1, F, cosine of theta, one, F, plus M2, V2, F, cosine of theta, to F, all right? That's your X component. Your Y component, well, I'm gonna rewrite everything, but I'm gonna use sines instead of cosines. M1, V1I, sine of theta one I, plus M2, V2I, sine of theta two I equals M1, V1F, sine, of theta one F plus M2 V2 F sine of theta two F. All right, so I get that one, one I, one I, two I, two I, one F, one F, yep. All right, those are the, these are the most general two-dimensional equations that you can have for a two-dimensional collision of point particles. And I don't care if you're taking college physics, university physics, or you're taking junior level mechanics, or you're taking graduate level mechanics, you're gonna see the same set of two equations. Now, what you're gonna do is when you're, when you're faced with a two-dimensional collision problem, you'll, what I teach you here is you're gonna start off with the most general collision equations you can possibly write, and they're gonna simplify them. All right, and I'm gonna show you how to do that here in the next problem. Any questions about this? Again, these are, the general, most general two-dimensional collision equation. Again, equations, and then and again, it's for point particles. I mean, obviously, if you had, if you had, if you allowed rotation, you'd have even more complicated stuff. But right now, we're we're talking so. We're talking about just uh, collisions of point particles. So you would start off by literally writing down, if, when you do a two-dimensional problem, you literally will write down the two most general equations possible. And then from there, you would, you would simplify. So let me show you how you do that. Any questions about this right now? I'm gonna work out problem 8.45 and we'll call it a done deal tonight. All right. And uh, thank you for uh, being here and, and I'm sorry we're teaching in this forum, but um, you know, again, I'd safety first. So, all right. So, problem eight point forty five. So, kind of you know, listen carefully. I don't want to rewrite all this. So, these will be steps of different steps of algebra for you. So, I have two identical pucks. Two identical pucks. Okay, and I'm doing now problem 8.45, open stacks, 8.45, all right? So we're gonna do a two-dimensional problem and it's gonna be number 45 out of open stacks. All right, so you have two identical pucks, 
collide on an air hockey table. So air hockey table basically means that it's like when you, you have the big air track in, in, in front of you in class, basically air hockey table, you know, those of you who play like, you know, air hockey and, uh, you know, the, at a arcade place or something, you know, that the, the air, the, 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 the uh, little uh, um, uh, um, layer of air, you know, causes almost a frictionless uh, situation for your, for your pucks. You can kind of hit them with your friend and go back and forth and, you know, you know, try to get into each other's goal. All right. So you got two identical pucks, they're identical on an air hockey table. One puck was originally at rest. Oh, okay. So one puck was originally at rest. I'm going to call that puck two. One puck was originally at rest. That means V two I equals zero. I'm going to say that I've, I have puck one that's going to come in and hit puck two and puck two is at rest. So that translates mathematically to V2I equals zero. Okay. Um, if the incoming puck has a speed of six meters per second and scatters to an angle of 30 degrees, what is the velocity making the direction of the second puck? Okay. So what that means is that the incoming puck is going to come in. What's it going to be? V1I is 6.0 meters per second. It's going to collide, bang, and it's going to scatter from the horizontal, or it's going to scatter at an angle of 30 degrees. So theta 1F is 30 degrees. Again, this, I'll, I'll say a few more things in a, in a moment. What's the velocity maker? Now, one of the things that we're going we're gonna to try to do here is we're going to actually make an assumption of, the, of an elastic collision, but in a very clever way. And I'll show you how we do that. Now, one of the things I can do is I can be smart about things. Okay, so again, you have the two most general equations that you can possibly write down. All right, so again, here's the two most general equations for, for collision problems you can write down. Now, two identical pucks. Ah, that means that two identical pucks means that M1 equals M2 equals M. All right, which basically means that I can turn all of these into M's. M1 is equal to M2, they're identical. So I can change all of these M1s and M2s into M's. And then what can I do after that? I can cancel them all out. So I'm already simplifying the equations. I already, am, I'm canceling out all the masses. So I wrote down the most two general equations I could possibly write down. And now, now that I, I'm utilizing information, two identical pucks, aha. That means M1 equals M2 equals M. Okay, I, I, don't, I don't have to worry about labels anymore on my Ms. And oh, by the way, hey, I have, I have M everywhere. I can just, every every uh, term has a common factor of M, cancel them all out. All right, so I'm already simplifying. V2I is zero. The second puck is at rest. Aha, V2I is zero. That means that entire term is gone. That term? is gone and this term is gone. So for the first equation, all that's left is the first term, this term is gone equals these two terms without the masses. And over here, I have um, this term still, no mass. This entire term is gone. And then I have the other two terms without the masses, all right? So, so far I'm just, I'm just simplifying things. Now, something else I can do that's really smart is I'm free to choose any coordinate system I want. Why don't I choose the x-axis that lines up with V1i? I'm gonna call that my x-axis. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna set my problem up such that V1i, such that the, the, the initial puck is going along what I'm declaring as x. What does that mean? That means that theta one i is zero. Again, I'm free to do that. So, so again, I'm, I'm short on space here. So I've already utilized some information. So I'm going to erase a little bit. So I already, I already utilized the fact we have two identical pucks. I'm going to get rid of that. And I've already utilized the fact that the uh, second puck is at rest. Again, one puck coming toward the other. This guy's at rest. Bang. Right. And this one is in the first puck scatters and the second puck scatters too. All right, but what I can say is that that is that theta one i is zero. Why? I'm lining. 
I line up motion or initial motion of puck one with what I'm calling the X axis. I'm perfectly free to do that. I am free to choose whatever coordinate system I want. And again, we always choose one of convenience. So I line up uh, initial motion of M1. So sorry about the squishing this here. Initial motion of M1 with X axis. I'm free to do that. So M1, I can choose M1 to go along the X axis so that it's theta one I is zero. All right. So that means I have a cosine of theta one I and a sine of theta one I. Well, this becomes zero. Cosine is zero. Theta two I, I didn't do anything with that, you know, but it doesn't matter because that term's gone anyway. Right, that term is already gone, so it doesn't even matter because initially it's at rest, so it doesn't matter. That term is gone. I don't know anything about. I, I know theta one f, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. But I also know that theta one i is zero. Okay, what's the cosine of zero? Again, these are different steps of algebra for you. What's the cosine of zero? Anybody? Uh, one. One. Cosine of zero is one. So again, this is another step of algebra for you. All right. But for me, I'm just going to kind of erase. And now I have, I'm multiplying this by one. And sine of zero is zero. Great. That means that first term, that first term is zero too. So this term is gone. So the so basically the second equation, I have nothing on the left hand side. Okay, I'm just doing simplification. So with that said, um, I'm going to um Try to write, try to write a simplified version here. So um, again, bear with me here. So all that's left on, on this term is just B1I. All right. So this first equation, what's left is just V1I. And I told you cosine of theta one I is zero, and I cancel out the mass. So all that's left there is B1I. Um, equals, okay, this whole term is gone. So bear with me here, that whole term is gone. Why? Because V2I is zero because the initial puck, the, the puck two is initially at rest. What do I have left over here? Well, I didn't do much of anything on the left-hand side here. I still have V1F cosine theta one F. Plus V2F cosine theta to f, but you know what? A good thing is I can at least write it on one line. All right. So again, the masses go away, but I've made some simplifications. That's a lot nicer now. All right. So let me erase the rest of this stuff. All right. So now um, what happens down here? Second equation, the, the y equation. Well, again, that term is zero because the sine is zero, zero. That term is zero because V2I is zero. So second equation, my whole left-hand side is nothing more than zero. The right-hand side, again, I cancel out the M's, but I didn't do much of anything else. I have V1F sine of theta 1F plus V2F sine of theta to F, all right? So I took the equations that were initially, um, you know, um, very uh, involved and not too pretty. And I brought, and I basically simplified them down to what you see in front of you. All right, so again, I'm following the, the logic or following the pattern. I write the most general equations I could possibly write down. And then I start simplifying. Cancel out the M's because I had all the M's are, are the same. now. What I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to violate my usual uh, rules, and that is I I tell you um, don't don't plug in values until the very end. Well, right now there's so much going on. Um, I'm going to tell you that right now you can plug in values, and that's okay. I want to make there's a hint in this problem, and the hint basically says that 
Now we're gonna, we're, we're basically assuming conservation of energy. And I know you don't see the problem in front of you. If so, if, if this is true, then final, then uh, the final angles are, so the, uh, the angle, then, um, then theta two, I'm sorry, theta one F plus theta two F equals 90 degrees. This is one of the, uh, it's a hint, but when you have a uh, conservation of energy for two-dimensional collision, and they're just helping you solve this problem this way, they're, they're, they're helping you understand this. So the, the two angles that uh, after the collision will actually form a 90 degree angle. So essentially what we're being told here is that the, is that this is your X axis and you know, you've collided, all right? So again, your, your initial velocity V1i is entirely along X, right? So as I said, I chose the coordinate system that way. We said that V2i, or I'm sorry, particle, um, particle, I guess I'm, I'm calling this particle one up here, okay? So particle one is gonna go off at theta one F. Well, we're basically saying that the second particle, which I'm calling a particle two, so it's different than my picture, I apologize, is theta two F. And if I said this was 30 degrees, then I'm gonna say that this is negative 60. All right, so the two must add together to be a right angle. That's the hint in the problem. So theta one F is gonna go off at 30 degrees. And again, in this case, it's different than what I wrote down before. Particle one's on top and particle two's on the bottom. All right, so labeling's a little different. So theta one F is, is, uh, is, uh, is going uh, up and theta two F is going down. And they, they're at right angles, so that's the hint. This is 30 degrees, so with that information, I can say that's negative 60. Are we okay with that? That's just a hint that we were given in the problem. All right, so great. Um, everybody have this down. So I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna rewrite a, my equations one more time. All right. So that said, let's. Uh, we're almost done, believe it or not. We're gonna really simplify things pretty well now. So we have nice ang we have nice angles. V1i, if you go back to the initial problem, I told you that the initial puck was going at six meters per second. So I'm gonna rewrite these, but I'm gonna put the numbers in. Again, I'm gonna violate my usual rules because right now these are complicated enough. Let's just put the numbers in. I usually tell you not to put the numbers into the end. 6.00 equals, I don't know V1f. I'm looking for V1f and V2f, by the way. Cosine theta one F, I told you theta one F in that last picture was 30 degrees. It's a cosine of 30. Plus V two F, again, that's another variable that I don't know I'm looking for. And cosine theta two F, I told you that was negative 60. Okay, that's what that, that's what that becomes. Over here, I have zero equals. V1F, I have the sine of 30 plus V2F cosine of negative, I'm sorry, brain's not working, sine of negative 60. All right, now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna utilize a property of uh, trigonometry. There's such a part. Of, there's such a function called an even function and an odd function. So I'm going to erase. I'm going to erase this up here, and um, so I'm going to rewrite this up here. So I apologize for the extra writing. It's just I don't have really a choice. So here's our equation with variables, and now I'm turning it into an equation that only has two variables. I mean, again, it's that was the case before, but it may not have been obvious. So I'm going to rewrite this. I apologize. So six point zero zero equals v one f cosine of 30 degrees plus V2F cosine of negative 60 degrees. 
And over here, I have zero equals phi one F sine of 30 degrees plus V two F sine of negative 60 degrees. All right. Now, before you, I want to make sure before you go, I want to, I want to also, I'm, I'm very curious of who, who's actually, who's attending today. So don't disappear yet until I, until I, um, I want to, I just want to, I'm just very curious of um, who's, show, who's uh, showing up today. So, so again, I want to kind of take some sort of an attendance. I'm probably going to be very, very lenient on attendance because some people just, I mean, you know, there's some people just can't go because of the weather and, 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 and I am making this available online. So, but I, but I do, don't, don't disappear. I, I want to know who's, who's actually here. So, okay. Now, there's two types of functions um, in trigonometry, or, or, or in mathematics, actually. We have even function and an odd function. An even function basically says that f of negative x is f of x. Doesn't really matter if the, if the function is negative or uh, not. It does. I mean, literally, I can replace it and just, and just not even worry about the, the negative sign. And on the other hand, odd function says that f of negative x is negative f of x. Now, an example of an even function is cosine. An example of an odd function is sine. Now, what does this possibly mean? Well, let's look at a cosine function. Look at it near zero. Cosine of zero is one, right? Now, on either side, it's gonna fall off like this, but you notice that there's a mirror image on the other side. And so literally I can, I can say cosine, if I pick some X over here and I have a negative X, the function's the same on either side of the, of the, of the, um, of the vertical axis. It's mirrored. The cosine function is mirrored. Is mirrored about x. Is, is mirrored about um, x equals zero. It's mirrored about the y-axis. That means that I can literally replace if I say cosine of negative x is equal to the cosine of x. Okay, this is cosine. On the other hand, if I did sine of sine of x, it actually um, actually ends up. You know, it's it's a negative of itself on the other side. So again. This is the cosine, even function. Sine, sine of zero is zero, right? And so if I look at the sine function, sine of zero is zero, and then sine is gonna go up and down and so on and so forth in sine of X. Down over here, it's gonna go down then go up and so on and so forth, right? And so if I say, hey, I have a sine of some x, negative x, well, the sine of x is going to be some positive value, but the sine of negative x, it's going to be upside down. It's going to flip. It's going to be, a, it's going to not be a mirror symmetry. It's going to be on the opposite side. This is called an odd function. Even functions are mirror each other. The odd function basically says that if I take sine of some negative x, it's the same as the sine of x. All right, so again, it follows this particular pattern. And so this is cosine and this is sine, All right? Don't, this is not part of the equation. All right, so how does that help me here? Well, what that says is that I can use this symmetry to kind of simplify things. So, so if I see, so, and I'll show you why here. When I see the cosine of negative 60, Well, it's an even function. Cosine of negative x is cosine x. That, put that in your calculator. It's the exact same thing as cosine 60. And if I see sine of negative 60, that's negative sine of 60. Again, cosine is an even function and sine is odd. All right. So how does that help me here? Again, this is another line of algebra for you. Cosine of negative 60, that's the same as the cosine of 60. 
done. And sine of negative 60, well, that's negative sine of 60. I can actually translate that negative out here. That way, I don't like plugging in negative values in my calculator. That's why, that's why I do that. I like to have my, I like to have values that I put in for sine and cosine to be somewhere between zero and 90 usually. So I don't usually like the negative values. And so I use the symmetry arguments to get rid of them. Is that clear to everybody? All right, so with that said, I've simplified my equation a little bit. Now I happen to know you're going to go and take the you're going to go off and take the G or, oh, I'm sorry the uh, MCAT physics test for instance you know the, you're going to be required to know what the cosine of 30 is and the, and the cosine of 60 and so forth right and so we know so next equation these are these are functions we don't need our calculator for I have v1f I know the sine of 30 so they flip flop right sine of 30 is a half cosine of 30 is a square root three over two okay and cosine of 30 is square root three over two plus V, and this is V1F, V2F, and a, the cosine of 60 is a half. All right? And then over here, I have zero equals sine of 30 is a half, one half V1F minus, and a sine of 60 square root three over two. Again, as I said, they flip flop. So minus square root three over two, V to F. All right. So literally from the complicated equation I had before, I've really, uh, I, I have really simplified them down to just these two equations with all the various simplifications that I made. I mean, basically applying, applying the, the actual problem to the most general equation. You start off with the most general two-dimensional equation and you simplify it down. Now this is pretty simple. In fact, we're, this is really good for us because I have zero over here, so I can literally I can literally take this equation, write v1. Let's see, what did I do? I I wrote v1f in terms of v2f, and I'm going to substitute into the other equation. All right, so I'm going to take the second equation. So I'm going to erase the top equation. We're almost done, guys. So I, I apologize. It's a painful lecture, I know. Um, I'm going to take the top equation. I'm going to kind of just rewrite it. So I'm going to write it as. Um, Square root three over two, I'm gonna kind of flip about the equal sign. So I have square root three over two, uh, V1F plus one half, V2F equals 6.00. And over here, I'm gonna have um, one half V1F minus the square root of three over two, V2F equals zero. All right, so again, I just, rewrote the last two equations there. Now we're going to kind of solve everything and be done. All right. So again, I, I have, uh, I'm kind of lucky here on the second, on the second equation. I can literally write it, you know, one variable in terms of the other. So I can literally just throw, I'm, I'm looking at the second equation. I can throw this term on the other side. I'm just looking at this equation. So I can write this as one half V1F is the square root of three over two V2F, I can get rid of the twos, and I can literally write that V1F is the square root of three V2F. Okay, I have one variable in terms of the others. What do I do now? Well, I'm going to plug it into the second equation. Instead of having a V2F up here, so let me kind of just put in a parking lot. I have this relationship. V1F is the square root of three. V2F, I'm just put, throw it in the parking lot. I need space. I'm gonna do some erasing now. And that's my parking lot over there. All right, so I don't need this equation either. So the second equation I've already used, again, you would not do this on your paper. I'm just doing this because I have to. Okay, now what? Well, I'm gonna simplify this equation a little bit and then I'm gonna make use of this. So one of the things, uh, you know, if you don't like fractions, hey, fine, get rid of them, multiply, every, multiply both sides by two. No problem there. Multiply by two to get rid of the twos, all right? And if I do that, I'll, I'll have um, the square root of three, um, V1F plus V2F equals 12.0, all right? All I did is I multiply through by two because, hey, we don't like fractions. You can just multiply through and get rid of them. 
Okay, now I can make use of the fact that uh, B1F is the square root of, is square root of three B2F. All right, so great. So square root of three, B1F is what? It's the square root of three B2F. And I still have this B2F equals 12.0. Square root of three times the square root of three is three. Three B2F, and it's getting simpler and simpler. Plus B2F equals 12, three plus one is four. Four B2F is 12.0. And I can write that V2F is just three meters per second. So V2F, one of my answers is 3.0 meters per second. I'll just write it up here. V2F is 3.0 meters per second. That's one of my answers. What do I do now? Okay, so again, I have that. I have this kind of in the parking lot from the first equation, kind of like just like we did with the... Um, but the first uh, problem, you know, we, we essentially went back to one we would label star. Well, this would be the one I would label star, this equation here. So I can erase everything else at this point, if you're okay with that. So all I really care about is this and this right now. So we're getting down to some, we're really, really uh, distilled the problem down to, from the most complicated equations, down to not much of anything. So again, I wrote that up in the upstairs here, so... I'm sort of trying to make sure I don't erase too much. All right, so now we're almost at the nitty gritty. So this is one of my answers. And now I have V1F is a square root of three times V2F. Well, I know what V2F is, it's three meters per second. And so when I do that, I have finally V1F is equal to 5.20. All right, those are the uh, final equations. And now, okay, so there's one other part of this problem, and that is we want to show that we want to prove show that kinetic energy is conserved. So this is the trick I want to tell you about before, and I got ahead of myself. So I do have two things that I know about now. I know these answers. So I know that V1F is 5.20 meters per second. So again, what I want to, and this is actually part A. This is actually part A. Part B is I want to prove that kinetic energy, or they say kinetic energy is conserved, prove that energy is conserved, but, you know, essentially all the energy that's actually uh, applicable right now is kinetic. So, and then I'm going to show you a little trick. So, kinetic energy being conserved, what I would find out is that I have the total uh, kinetic energy initial. I'm going to divide it by the total kinetic energy final and see what I get, all right? So kinetic energy initial, well, remember I only had one hockey puck that was actually moving. And it's actually, you know what? I'm going to do final over initial, I apologize. So final over initial. All right, so both were moving. And again, with energy, I don't care what angle they're, um, the, the, the vector is. All I care about is the magnitude of the vector. With energy, I don't care about angles. I don't care about components. I only care about the magnitude of the vector. So what I would say is I have uh, one half M1 V1 F squared plus one half M2 V2 F squared divided by um, one half M1 V1 I squared plus one half M2 V2 I squared, All right? That's how you generally do it. Uh, final kinetic energy over initial kinetic energy. Again, kinetic energy of the system. I have two particles. Final, you know, my final kinetic energy would be the kinetic energy of the Final kinetic energy of particle one, final kinetic energy of particle two, add them together. In the bottom, I have the initial kinetic energy of uh, particle one plus the initial kinetic energy of particle two. Now, we have a couple of simplifications. Remember, you know, M1 equals M2 equals M. All the pucks are the same mass, so all these Ms, again, cancel out. I can't always do that, but 
But if the if the masses are all the same, I can do that. And I also told you that the um, that that the initial puck the puck two was it was initially at rest. So I can actually say that's zero. And so what I can actually do is write this um, this fraction. And I'll show you why I'm writing a fraction in a moment here. Kinetic energy final over kinetic energy initial. Well, what do we end up with? And also, by the way, all these one halves can cancel out too. We don't need them anymore either. They're all, one half is common to everybody. So what's left over? I have a V1 F squared plus a V2 F squared. And on the bottom, the only thing that I have is a v1 i squared all right so again that fraction that ratio um literally just uh distills down to what you see here okay i'm going to erase this body here and i'm going to and i'm going to rewrite this so again i apologize for all the extra writing but we are we're very 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 close to being done i don't need this anymore either all right so as I just got done saying, the ratio of the final kinetic energy to the initial kinetic energy is V1F squared plus V2F squared divided by V1I squared, all right? What's left to do is just plug in the numbers and we'll see something kind of cool happen. So kinetic energy initial, or sorry, final, over kinetic energy initial, well, I know what the answers are. V1 F squared is, is uh, 5.20, so 5.20 meters per second squared plus 3.0 meters per second squared. And that's divided by the initial velocity of puck one was 6.0 meters per second quantity squared. All right, well, what, what does this end up looking like? Well, if you, if you work out the calculation here, you'll find out that this adds up to 36.0. Again, this is gonna be meters squared over second squared, meters squared over second, all the, all the units cancel out. On the bottom, six squared is 36.0, which is equal to 1.0. So again, I, I can show in a very slick way that the conservation of energy is, a, is achieved if I rate if I make a ratio, it's one of the many ways of showing this. If I make a ratio of the final kinetic energy, initial kinetic energy, and I find out that ratio is unity. If that is true, then energy is conserved. So I just got done proving here that energy is conserved. And I, I actually forced that to happen because I said because I was given the hint that the that the um, angles, the final angles were at 90 degrees. That's true for uh, a system where the energy is conserved. And all this is just doing is verifying that what I said was actually right. All right, so that is, uh, I just wanna kind of, I wanna take a look at the attendance here and just make, oops, just um, see who's actually here. And then, um, so here I am. Um, so we're done with the lecture. I just want to see, I just want to look at the attendance real quick. All right, Alexis, who, who's T-O-S-I-N? That's Olua Tosin, Professor. Oh, wow. Okay, you've reduced your name. <laughs> I know. It's just a short version. <laughs> That's all right. So, okay, Olua Tosin, Alexis, Cother. Let me, let me write down the, let me write down you guys. Yeah. Give me one second. I'm going to disappear okay. into my office. I'm back. All right. Yeah, I thought you I thought you turned yourself into a math function. <laughs> T you know, T O S I N. All right. Let's see here. So Ola Watteson is here. 
I have Alberto. Ola Watterson. Present. So Cother's here, Ellen's here, Megan. Uh, is anybody else? Let's see, I hit the arrow here. Oh, I have Kesha, Riley. And I think that's it. Did I miss any? Oh, Marissa, Marissa's and Bao. All right, so I have who's here is Alberto, Olawadison, Cother, Ellen, Megan, Kesha, Riley, Marissa, and Bao. And did I miss anybody? Did you get me Alejandra? Alejandra. I'm oh, sorry. Double I saw, I saw <laughs> did double you get a. Ruth? I, yes, Ruth, I actually talked to you. I'm so sorry. Ruth, yes. And Mahmoud is here. Uh, of course, I talked to you. And <laughs> so am I. Anybody Edmundo. else? Huh? Edmundo, I'm here. Oh, Edmundo, Edmundo. I, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm only, my brain's only half here. So. <laughs> All right. I think I got everybody. So I have two. Oh, yeah. So that's actually a really good attendance. So, so again, I, I hope, uh, is everybody, the storm kind of settled down for everybody now? Or are things crazy? For yeah, some it, people? It, it, it's just pretty nice. It's just a little bit of sparkling outside. For me. Okay, good, good. Yeah, it was pretty bad earlier. So they're caught, they're possibly talking about 80 mile an hour winds. I've never seen that in Fort Worth uh, before. I actually yeah, had a tree that went down, but it went down, thankfully, on um, away from my house. 50 <laughs> 50. And I guess I I got the I should buy a lotto ticket. I mean, I guess I got the uh I got the uh I got the lucky break, <laughs> literally. Yeah, yeah, it's uh it just stayed a little bit in Arlington and then bam, it disappeared. Awesome. Stay safe, everybody. Huh? Stay safe. Yes, yes. Thank you. Yes. So I'm done. If anybody wants has any questions, um, again, I just I I literally as I said, I I wanted to do three problems, and as you see, it's it's about oh my god, so what? It's eight thirty right now. <laughs> well, I told you. I mean, the last problem took a while, and it probably took even longer because I had to keep erasing things on the board. So, uh, any questions? I mean, again, we talked about elastic collisions. One dimension, I talk about the general way of doing two-dimensional collisions. Now there is a um, there is a uh, video that I have online. It's a, it's a controversial momentum video where I do this exact same thing. So again, you can replay this. You can also um, look at the videos that are done a little bit better online. Um, I think uh, they're in the uh, YouTube videos. So I'll I'll actually send you a I'll I'll, I'll write an announcement, send a link to that. Uh, if you want, if you want to do that, this should be good enough, but you know, but this, this, this really, uh, I would say concludes our controversial momentum chapter. So we're done with chapter seven at this point. I'll, I'll assign the problems at this point. And, um, does anybody have any other questions? Uh, someone asked, uh, uh, about the homework. Um, yeah. Uh, is there a, another submission on the next Tuesday for the chapter uh, six? So I will sign a uh, homework tonight. We we went through chapter seven tonight, or our, our chapter seven this week. So there will be a chapter seven homework um, that'll be next Tuesday. Yes. Yes. So next Tuesday we'll have. So next Tuesday chapter seven homework will be due, and also the um, the uh, um, uniform circular motion lab will be due too. Do we also turn in chapter six homework then uh, next Tuesday? Ooh, yeah. Chapter six one will be doing next Tuesday as well. <laughs> yes, hopefully that was done before tonight, right? So, um, yeah, don't don't try to turn it online. Just turn it next week. I mean, it's one of those things. I I um, I can't. You know, we can't control the weather. So yeah. So yeah. So next week, next Tuesday will be chapter six as well. It should have been tonight, but clearly we're not together. Good questions. Any other question? That's it for me. Excellent. Yeah. So I, I got you guys. Um, I'm, probably, I'm going to be leaning on, on attendance. I mean, I'm, some people probably just flat out couldn't make it. Most of you guys are actually here. What about two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, yeah, 13. I think we have 19 students now. So 13 out of 19, it's only six missed. So that's pretty good. I mean, I, I was not expecting even that good. Um, you know, we, we literally had, I had literally tornado sirens go blaring off um, 15 minutes before this class started.
So it was kind of like, better. well, yeah, my wife didn't exactly think it was a good idea for me to <laughs> have this class. Yes, so, I'm glad everybody was safe, guys. Yes. All right. Um, I guess I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna uh, I will uh, start the uh, start this start the saving process. It takes a little while, and then I'll put this on YouTube, and then I'll um, I'll give you the link to it. Now, thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks. Uh huh. You bet. Take care. Oh, uh, did you give me for attendant attendance, Alexis? Alexis. I think I wrote you down. No, you know what? I did not write you down. Th thank you. Yes, Alexis. Great. 14 people. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's hard to see her. I think, yeah, I got you. I got you, Alexis. Have a good night.